9th institute talk on consumer happiness to be de- delivered by professor sandeep patnaik the program director of marketing program uh, of university of maryland global campus so to give a brief uh, background of professor patnaik so professor patnaik has been the indian civil servant uh, of 1990 batch and served in the ministry of finance and communications uh, in government of india uh, so after few years then in 1997 he joined water school of uh, uh, water school of management university of pennsylvania as a research scholar and he has worked with professor uh, scott armstrong in the area of persuasive advertising so both of them they have published their research work in terms of a handbook of advertising principles subsequently he joined as the research director of gallop and robinson a leading market research firm in gallop organizations and uh, then professor patnaik is also certified in digital marketing science and american marketing association so uh, he has been all along in the along in teaching the uh, marketing and management subjects in different universities has delivered law, uh, law many, many uh, talks uh, in both in europe america and all, all across the world then he is uh, but his current research uh, interest uh, has been uh, the, has been focused on sustainable marketing leveraging the digital marketing uh, platform in this uh, pandemic uh, era psychology and behavioral economics so these are few words about his background so now i invite professor patnaik to deliver his talk on consumer happiness and enlighten us in this direction thank you now please professor patnaik please i welcome you again once again well uh, thank you professor for your generous introduction um i truly appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with the iit fraternity um as mentioned as you mentioned i have worn many hats in the past as a civil servant as a teacher a researcher and uh, currently i think the loop is back again i started off as teacher and i'm back to teaching and research in some of our um higher education administration but um i have had the chance to look at life through several lenses as um, uh our friend um mention about like going through the various stages of life and so we kind of appreciate the same context in the same um, issue from a different, different perspective so i'll try my best to share some of the perspective uh that i have gleaned over the years but um let me start off with a theoretical understanding of the consumer the concept of consumer happiness as we understand it in marketing now this will be slightly different in fact this will be pretty different from the more uh, scholarly discussions that you have this your center may have had in the past this is more of a practitioner's point of view and i'll try and share some leading contributions in the area and conclude with a brief prediction of what lies ahead so this should not take more than 30 to 40 minutes Uh, after that i look forward to uh, discussing and engaging with you with any questions or comments that you may have so um let me move to the first slide please yep so let me start off with the construct the happiness construct so conceptually uh, as you know happiness is a very broad concept and is one of the coveted virtues of virtually every culture I recall uh, reading about uh, Aristotle's philosophy of uh, pursuing eudaimonia or happiness being the ultimate goal of human thought and action. Our own Vedanta philosophy describes the ultimate goal of life to be one of blissful happiness. Judaism also extols happiness um, or simcha as an important element in the service of God. So in fact the traditional concept of happiness is so closely intertwined so closely embedded with the ethical and virtuous life that the pursuit of happiness was deemed to be an inalienable right and embedded in the US constitution along with the other god-given right of life and liberty Over time however happiness has come to be associated the focus has shifted more on the individual than at a societal level uh, as one scholar aptly observed that over time the emphasis has shifted from the happiness of virtue to the virtue of happiness happiness as understood in business circle 
is more in terms of more of a transactional level in the terms of consumer satisfaction than in the psychological holistic well-being as defined by um, scholars like like this you know social psychologists and so focus in marketing especially is more on eventual outcome or the benefit instead of the psychological process itself we will have more more uh, opportunity to tease these apart as we um, go along the talk next slide so the importance of customer so customer is is often regarded you know is at the core of the marketing of the business principle uh, peter drucker who is often regarded as the founder or the guru of modern management gave probably the best definition of happiness at the definite purpose best definition of the purpose of business as being limited to creating and keeping a customer so in other words you may have the best product or service but without a customer you are not a business but to my mind perhaps no one explained the importance of customer better than gandhi ji did and so here is a quote that should probably be displayed in every business anywhere in the world in fact i had framed it and kept it um in my in my in my office when i, I was in the public service so in his letter to the chambers of commerce gandhi ji wrote that a customer is the most important visitor on the premise he is not dependent on us we are dependent on him he is not an interruption of work he is the purpose of it he is not an outsider of a business he is part of it we are not doing him a favor by serving him he is doing us a favor by giving us the opportunity to, to do so i cannot imagine a more ringing endorsement of what the customer represents and what customer service ought to be in business now a little heads up at this stage you will hear me using the term consumers and customers interchangeably throughout this talk even though technically they are different like in simple terms a customer is one who buys a product or service the consumer is one who ultimately consumes the product or service however mo most of our uh, research in marketing has revolved around uh, customers and some of it in consumers so virtually all consumers uh, to to step back all while all consumers are customers the reverse may not be true however for the sake of simplicity simplicity i have collapsed the terms together and i request you to indulge me in in this so um can you can you move to the next slide please yeah um next slide yes so the importance of customer happiness or consumer happiness so customer satisfaction and happiness have a profound impact on the longevity of a product or service the most obvious impact is on brand equity which is the value of a brand name very simply put so positive brand equity helps the product or service establish itself strongly in the marketplace it makes the brand more resistant to volatility it also results in more recommendations of the brand which we will see uh, later means a higher net promoter score conversely negative brand equity depletes sales eventually resulting in the failure of the product happier customers also mean less defection to other brands studies have shown that acquiring a new customer is usually four times more expensive than retaining a customer so higher retention of customers results in less churn or as we say less dropping off of customers and helps the brand to be more stable in the marketplace happier customers also have a higher customer lifetime value now this is a typical marketing jargon and uh, there's a lot of calculations and formula involved in it but in simple terms the customer lifetime value or clv represents the value customer um the value the customer contribute to a business over a whole period of the relationship 
So for example, a customer who makes five visits to a store in a year, buying a hundred dollars worth of goods on each visit is more valuable or has more higher CLV than a customer who just makes two trips but spends $200 in each visit. So the first one, five visits, $100, $500, and the second one, two, two trips of $200, $400, so $500 is more than $400. So we, we kind of calculate the CLV, uh, business, businesses calculate CLV uh, in terms of um, in, in, with a different equation. So. Uh, the customer happiness, a happy customer is a loyal customer. They come back repeatedly, they don't drop off very fast, and they also spread the good word around. Next slide. So we come to the perceived value and satisfaction. Now this is, um, as we say, satisfaction or, or uh, just like beauty, it lies, lies in the eyes of the beholder. And marketers have interpreted satisfaction has have used satisfaction happiness almost coterminously and they have framed happiness in a more transactional manner anchoring the usage to a cost benefit analysis where customers are happy when they get superior value for the price that they pay so we know now that satisfaction is not happiness but most of the early studies gauging customer happiness have, have tied it more tangible benefits than any improvement in underlying effective state status. So um, if the performance uh, or experience, your customer experience falls short of expectations, the customer is dissatisfied. If it matches the expectations, the customer is satisfied. If it exceeds expectations, the customer is highly satisfied or delighted. And that is the kind of a you know, gold standard that every uh, good organization strives for. Now, consumers also have varying degree of loyalty to specific brands, stores and companies. So brand loyalty, which you may have heard about uh, frequently mentioned in, 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 uh, uh, in business uh, papers has been defined as a deeply held commitment to rebuy or repatronize a preferred product or service in the future, even if the contextual situation changes. So for example, you may change your house, but still continue to visit the your, your favorite barber store or your favorite grocery store, even if you have to travel across the city. So this, 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 is, this, is, this is the customer loyalty, the consumer loyalty that every business strives to attain. Next, next slide, please. Um, the consumer behavior process um, is actually in the modern marketplace is very complex and sophisticated. Uh, it will take probably the all, all day long to really go into each aspect. But here is a snapshot of the, you know, I've tried to capture the essence in a single uh, picture. And so um, it's, it's deliberately simplified uh, for the purpose of this talk. So in this model, first, a set of marketing stimuli that includes, you know, the, typically the four P's, um, product, uh, service, price, distribu price, distribution, promotions, along with environmental stimuli, such as cultural, economic, and ecological factors, impact on the consumer's consciousness. Subsequently, a set of psychological processes, including perception, memory, motivation, and learning, all, all these factors are studied in depth by psychologists, um, combined with certain socio-cultural characteristics, again, the domain of social scientists, influence the buying decision processes. Now, the buying process starts with the consumer searching for information, followed by an evaluation of alternatives, and finally making a decision to buy. Now, this is a purchase decision. We have not come to the stage of the actually making a purchase. So you, 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 you want to buy a, a computer, a laptop, you have a need perception, um, depending on what you're looking for, you evaluate different um, computers, different models and brands. Um, and then you, you settle on, on a decision to buy that, okay, we are, I'm going to buy a, um, a HP laptop. 
But then the final step is actually buying the product or service. So the, the big hurdle for marketers is the last mile, as we call it, of converting purchase intentions to purchase behavior. And that is where a lot of external factors, such as your past experience, your, your state of mind and decision making, all this comes to play. And that's the, those, those are very important variables which we will um, have a little you know, occasion to take a look at when we talk about the, the consumer choice later in, the, in this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so keeping customers happy is, uh, which is customer relations management, CRM and then abbreviation. So CRM is important because a major driver of the company, um, you know, is, is, is profitability. Is the, is the, you know is is what is the sum total of the of the value of the customer to the to the company? So, in this regard, there's a lot of strategies of CRM, and um, I, I will keep it short by um, by by touching on, on, uh, on dealing with some of the major factors. So, in in the CRM. There are multiple touch points along the way. The, 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 the time when you call up the, the vendor, the, the time you go to the store, or you ask for more information, every time you interact with the brand or a company, that's called a touch point. So the process of carefully managing detailed information about individual customers, every time you talk, they will ask you about a phone number or email and so on. So they are trying not to lose you after this interaction so they can follow up. Even if you buy the product, companies still have you in the radar. So even if you have just bought a car, you just have, you'll still get a lot of literature, a lot of uh, uh, emails regarding the new new models which have come to the market. And you say, hey, I just bought the car last year. I'm not going to change it again. But they just want to be in your in your radar, in, 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 your, um, um, in your area of consideration. So personalizing marketing, which is, which is, has become a big vogue right now, the, it's almost customizing is about making sure that the brand and its marketing are personally relevant to you as much as, as possible. So not everything, uh, you know, when you look at a product and say, yeah, I, I, I don't need all that stuff. I, however, I need something like if you, if somebody has a, um, let's say a disability, um, a special need, so they will need special accommodation in, in a product. How can I use, um, you know, the voice to text features and so on in different te in technical details. So customization is now the new mantra in, in marketing. So to adapt to customers increased need, desire for personalization, marketers have embraced concepts such as permission. So they first ask you, hey, can we can you offer you this? And then they go from there rather than just um, bundling it along with just okay here is the product that you that you buy rather rather than um, getting customers to products they actually get the products to the customer so say what do you need and then we can prepare accordingly so that that's where the personalization factor comes in and it's become of increasing and paramount importance marketers are also helping uh, consumers become evangelists by providing them research and opportunities. You have the social influencers and YouTube, lots of companies are promoting, um, uh, you know, to, to, to actually incentivizing customers to become their brand ambassadors. Um, although the strongest influence on cost consumer choice remains recommended, um, recommended by relative and friend, that's where, you know, the word of mouth strategy, an increasingly important decision factor is recommendation from consumers. So you are you are, you are not just previously in the traditional marketing arena, you basically looked out at your friends or relatives. Now we are taking actually advice from total strangers, even though sometimes we know that they are paid for by the brand from YouTube and social media. Um, and finally, we come to the, that's the, the, you know, the, the customer complaints, which is, which is a very important aspect of uh, customer management happiness. And, and studies show that while customers um, are dissatisfied with the purchases about 25% of the time, only about, you know, 5% of them complain. Now the other 95%, the non-complainers, 
either feel uh, complaining is not worth the effort or do not know whom or how to complain. I mean, you, you get a bad product and you kind of say it, it's not worth um, complaining and nobody will listen either. And they just, you know, they just stop buying. Um, of the customers who register a complaint, uh, about, you know, 54% to 70%, and this is a big study which, um, which is done recently, will do business with the organization again if, the, if their complaint is resolved. So there is a high chance that the majority of the customers who have a complaint, who make a complaint, if the complaint is resolved, they will, they will come back. And if, if it is resolved quickly, then as, as high as 95% complainers will come back to the brand. Um, so all this is to show that resolving a complaint um, is very important for retention of customers. Many companies, especially in the government sector, we have experienced that say, okay, if, if we do not do anything, if you keep quiet, then they will stay. But the chances are, if you do not address the complaint, do not have a proper complaint uh, redressal mechanism, then its chances are that you may lose customers. Uh, next slide, please. Next one. Can we have the next slide, please? Sir, is it visible? Uh, not really. Um, uh, the paradox of choice, the next one. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So let me take you take the opportunity to share some of the important scholarly contributions that psychologists and behavioral economists have made to the field of consumer decision making and engagement. And um, these are these are my personal favorites. I mean, there are many others, but I feel that psychologists, and especially behavioral economics, which is a combination of psychology and economics, have made a very distinct contribution to the field of marketing, especially in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And one of the best known contributions to individual decision making was by psychologist Barry Swarge. Um, Full confession, I, I used to know Professor Swarge, he was a neighbor and he's a professor in the Swarnburg College, which is um, very close to where I live. So one of the most original professors, very, very um, realistic. And uh, I mean, his contribution to the, to the field of marketing is really tremendous. Um, and so Swartz, in his paradox of choice, um, propose, proposes a counterintuitive theory that greater choice actually leads to greater anxiety and confusion. So this, this is contrary to the usual, in the, in the, what we think that if you give more choice, people will be more happy. Actually, uh, Swartz, uh, on his basis of his studies, and which is ranges from offering customers, you know, a variety of jams. Uh, so in, in one, one group, they were offered, customers were offered a choice of like 24 choices of jam and the other one was just six. And then the, and again, the same thing with the college, um, picking up college courses, uh, too many courses, students get confused, have more limited courses, uh, less anxiety, less stress. So on the basis of number of empirical studies, he, he was, um, he, he developed this, um, um, the term of paradox of choice. And Swartz, of course, derived his ideas of maximizers and satisfiers, which are now key terms in choice um, decision making, uh, from the work of an earlier psychologist, uh, Herbert Simon, um, who in the 1950s, who originally discussed those, the, the psychological stress that decision making ent entails. So maximizers are perfectionists uh, who need to be assured that they had um, you know, they, they make every purchase decision that was the best that could be made. You know, this creates a psychological daunting task that can become even more daunting um, as the number of options increases. You know, some of, in some of us um, may have experiences imagining going to a sari shop and looking at every sari of every color before arriving at, at a decision. Right. So you, you just want to make sure that you are not missing out a, a better shade or a better quality because you, you just want to make sure you want to ensure that your your decision that you arrive at is, is perfect. And very often it leads to more psychological stress. The alternative to maximizing is to be a satisficer. 
Now, a satisficer has also has criteria and standard. It's not just it does he or she doesn't make any decision based on nothing, but is not overly worried about the possibility that may that may may be something better. Um, Swartz's ideas have um, really proved to be influential even outside the domain of marketing. You know, the current minimalist or voluntary simplicity where you are restricting choice. People are going in for more simpler decision making rather than getting into the, you know, being being really obsessive about making the perfect decision, but being satisfied, being being saying that, okay, I have this set of clothes and I'm happy with it. Or I have, I don't need need that bigger car, larger house. So this this the whole trend of having, you know, the 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 less is more. Um, that that's that's a philosophy that can that can be that has really gained ground, especially in the West, and that can be traced to some of the has been influenced by some of the findings of uh, this paradox of choice. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, possibly my favorite scholar in this domain is uh, Professor Richard Taylor. And those of you may have um, heard of him and know him. Um, he's one of the leading behavioral economists uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2017. And his book, Nudge Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness is one of the most fascinating account of how psychological principles are interwoven with economic decisions. I would really recommend everyone to read that book because it's not only um, not only really insightful, but also really engaging, really funny and um, humorous. So Taylor is not in favor of compulsion, but suggests providing minor nudges, minor pushes to influence the so-called choice architecture now an example of a nudge would be um, in a for example in a school cafeteria uh, when you where you put healthier food at eye level while putting less healthy junk food in in hard to reach places i mean in, in our own houses if you have candy or you have chocolate right in front of you in the in the refrigerator so every time you open it you kind of you know you have it and you feel like reaching out but if you put it a little more, a little more um, in, a, in inside or where it's difficult to access, then you probably that's a nudge. That's the example of a, of a nudge. Another example uh, of uh, you know being uh, keeping um, again in the stores, for instance, if you have um, healthier food instead of the usual potato chips in the checkout near the checkout line in a store, then you would be able to promote. Um, you know, healthier options in eating. So nudge, he's not, as I said, he's, it's not about banning something. It's providing alternatives, providing, uh, make, making sure that you are, you have more easier access uh, to, to more, um, to, to, to more positive stimuli, let's put it, um, than, than something that is, um, that is, that is not good for your well-being. And nudge has been incorporated in many governments around the world uh, with a variety of causes, especially in the UK, where they had a department um, dealing with um, how, how to introduce nudge in public policy. And even in the US, um, for a variety of causes, uh, improving customer choice, nudging customers for in, in retirement savings, promoting health care, um, organ donations, and so on. Uh, I will recommend that you, um, if you're interested, please watch Taylor's interviews on YouTube. There are many that he has is, is delivered and so they are pretty long. They are never, never, never boring, always engaging. He comes up with such great examples um, that it's your time will be well spent. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yep. So. The prospect theory. Um, prospect theory in consumer decision making is again by the work of Danny Kahneman, um, again a psychologist, but he won the Nobel Prize in economics, causing some of us in psychology to be really happy because, you know, 
psychologists are really involved, unfortunately, in decision making. But he was in the front row, Danny Kahneman and uh, Amos Tversky, when the won the prize, Nobel Prize. Um, it was it was due to his contributions in in psychological influences decision making, and so they developed uh, Tversky and Kahneman developed a prospect theory in behavioral economics, uh, that is worth discussion in the context of consumer choice and decision making. So prospect theory. <clears throat> Possess that consumers are inherently risk averse. So consumers would rather have a lower gain with more certainty than risk a higher gain that is less certain. So if given a chance of winning, let's say fifty dollars with certainty, rather than taking a risky bet in which you can either win a hundred dollars or nothing at all, just like coin flip, then. Most consumers prefer the certainty of fifty dollars than the uncertainty of winning hundred dollars. So you see, perhaps in the you know Khan Benega Karupati or the How to Become Billionaires, some people, even though like they say, okay, we are going home with whatever we have, we are not going to risk more. Even though if they had attempted the question and the question was revealed, they could probably answered it, but they 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 rather win, you know. Uh, they 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 would uh, they're satisfied what whatever the limited running then so people are inherently risk averse, and prospect theory identifies three biases that consumers make in the decision making, and all of which have been these biases have been made use by marketers. So marketers have uh, tried to try to embed assured certainty by offering guaranteed discounts. If customers undertake certain tasks, for example, customers may get maybe ten percent off if they sign up for the email list, or get um, X amount off if they refer to the product or the brand to a friend or colleague. So they, they, you know that if they, it is call to action is if you do do this and you'll certainly get this. Um, so they, they kind of. In in most of the marketing offerings, they 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 assure a certain guaranteed benefit if they undertake certain tasks. Next is the isolation bias. Now, isolation bias is derived from the psychological principles that when multiple multiple stimuli are presented, the stimulus that differs from the rest is more likely to be remembered. We also call it the unique. Selling proposition, the USP for those of you who are acquainted with marketing. So, um, make making your product, making your offering distinct and new, unique has its own advantages. So, marketers, for example, have used advertisements that have different colors and different themes that can be distinguished from from other normal looking items, right? So. The third bias that is loss aversion is capitalized by marketers by creating a sense of urgency and scarcity. For example, the advertisement may urge a quick call to action with "Hurry, stock is limited, uh, selling fast," you know, or "Discount just today; um, it's it's not going to be there tomorrow." So there's customers are complete are always prompted to take immediate decisions in order not to lose out you know the social media acronym of fomo fear of missing out is also you know leveraged by social media strategists uh, taking taking cue from this loss aversion bias next slide please So we now come to the metrics, and this is measuring customer satisfaction. So while there are established scales of measuring happiness, as those um, all of you researchers know, like uh, subjective happiness scale or the Oxford Happiness in Inventory or the Panas, all of which we we in psychology are uh, use. Most I was really surprised while researching for this talk that most businesses have not really made use of them. So marketers and businesses um, have, however, adopted some um, the, the other scales that are more limited in nature. So a widely used scale is the customer satisfaction scale or CSAT, and CSAT scores are very easy to calculate. 
And so these are based on the rating. You know, when you uh, businesses ask you to rate on a four star or five star scale, and so after you give those ratings, um, for example, all the five five star and four star ratings are added up, then divided by the number of total responses, and multiplied by hundred. So if you say um, like eight out of ten, uh, three people. Um, let's say 10, 10 ratings, then if you total of four and five, add up to eight out of 10 responses, then you get a, the, the, is a percentage, it's a given a rating, of CSAT score of 80. And so it, it, it is an instant, um, it's a very u- user friendly, very easy to calculate kind of metric. And um, that kind of represents, supposed to represent the percentage of customers who are satisfied with their brand experience. However, as you know, uh, as you can see, it's very, very limited when it comes to measuring a customer's ongoing relationship with the company or loyalty. So it doesn't give any any story about whether you you had any past experience or in future, uh, whether you will be going back. I mean, you are satisfied with the restaurant for that visit, but it has no inkling that we do, you know doesn't give an indication whether going back. So another is the customer effort score or CS and. This measures how hard it is it was for customers to complete a task. So CES surveys uh, typically ask the question um, on a scale of very easy to very difficult, how easy was it to interact with uh, that product or a company? So the idea is that customers are more loyal to a product or service that is easier to use. So if they ask you, yeah, it was, it was, I, I didn't find this. Um, I found this software to be easy to handle and I, I could understand it and so on. So they say, okay, if, if you did not have experience problems, then you retain, you're going to stick to it, right? And finally, the best known um, um, scale is the, is the net promoter score, the NPS, which we had referred to it earlier. It contains a single question that how likely are you to refer a friend? So the assumption is um, that if if the if you are recommending a brand brand or a product or a service to another friend, then you are you are a loyal customer, and so it it infers its NPS is used to infer loyalty, and the NPS assumes that on a ten point scale, those who provide ratings of nine or ten are promoters, um, the people who are below six are detractors. So between six and nine are passive people. It's like a bell curve. So nine and 10 promoters, less than six detractors. So they, they kind of work on these promoters to make them evangelists. So they kind of say, say that, okay, you, you loved your experience in staying in the hotel. Would you like to um, talk about us in social media? If, if you do that, then again, they, they build up this incentive that your next free next visit one day will be free and so on so um this is a very popular um, very popular metric and it's estimated that about two-thirds of the fortune 1000 companies use nps to gauge customer loyalty um i feel feel um um professor chatri uh, would be um, I, I did not really know to be honest and confess that um bhutan has a gross national happiness and that includes dimensions such as ecological stability, sustainability, promotion of culture, good governance, and equitable socioeconomic development. I mean, these are all great criteria, and uh, I will definitely educate myself on how those uh, metrics are being measured. And um, I do hope that these will be you know, other countries will follow suit. This, this is a great initiative. Uh, next, next slide, please. <clears throat> Yeah, neuromarketing. So marketers have also made extensive use of neuroscience to gauge emotional reactions to marketing stimuli. So um, you have, um, you know, the fMRI and the EEG, et cetera. Those those are very commonly used um, techniques. And one specific technique that I am, I had been personally associated with is the facial electromyograph a myography technique, facial EMG. Now, this was developed by researchers at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, I was then the research director at Gallup and Robinson, and I happened to see the presentations and invited them for 
a demo at a, at a um, company and we adopted it and we decided to adopt um, facial EMG to test our uh, you know, television ad research ad research so it was very successful um, and we got a lot of top companies like NBC and Johnson Johnson and a few other companies as a client and it is it is a fascinating um, um, technique so the technique basically involved hooking up uh, respondents with electrodes around the eyebrows and chin and so the electrodes measured uh, even minute degrees of muscle activities while respondents are watching um, video clips right so it is a great way to obtain real real time data on emotional reactions because sometimes when we ask the respondents to describe what they saw then a lot of it is lost in translations so the once the emotional reactions are difficult to capture in cognitive terms so a kind of a non physiological a physiological measure and an instant uh, measure in in the, in the emg was um, was very helpful and the uniqueness of our technique at that time and talking about 10 years earlier was that it showed it also showed the balance of the direction of the emotion so it is not just doesn't didn't just measure arousal like blood pressure like heartbeat but also showed whether the emotion was positive or negative so that 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 was a um, technique that um, that that was very helpful in engaging the emotional reactions of uh, consumers to advertisements next next clip next. okay so finally the my final slide is that we have taken a small review of uh, what what the status of the discipline is so wh where do we go from now um, so what is what are the important criteria that consumers look for being happy or pleased with the brand and company so um, respect of privacy is one of the topmost concerns of consumers and this has especially been amplified in recent post pandemic era where a lot of businesses have gone digital right uh, a lot of our data is in, in, the, in the public domain so the european union's uh, gdpr that's a general data protection regulations which was enacted a few years earlier and was then deemed to be very restrictive and I was to wonder how they would be, if at all, that could be adopted. Now that has become the norm uh, of all all over the globe. And big uh, tech companies like Google and Microsoft uh, have started self-regulating. So they have now disabled a lot of cookies, and they have uh, kind of at least um, they this they, they say that they have now limited their access to consumer data um, on their platforms. So consumers are increasingly pushing back against intrusive companies that violate that um, their their privacy or they harvest their private data without permission. So this is going to be a big feature. Um, companies will have to establish a more uh, have, will have to respect privacy of the of the consumers much more in the days to come. Uh, trust is again. Uh, trust as as is a very important as it's as it is for in human interactions at other levels as well so um, the recent um, trust brand trust survey the Edelman trust survey which is one of the reckoned to be a very a gold standard in um, such surveys in 2020 reported that uh, you know across 12 nations and India was one of them uh, that trust is regarded as one of the top four um, criteria is top four indices along with quality and value and price um, of, of a brand. So 70% of uh, said that trusting a brand is more important in the post pandemic situation than in the past. Today's consumers again are, are especially the Gen Z and um, Gen Alpha all those uh, youngsters who were born after 2010 are very envir environmentally conscious and use their wallet, their purchasing power, to encourage companies to be more ecologically uh, conscious. Then um, recently I also came across a very um, detailed survey by PwC um, that the Global Consumer Insight 2020 report that consumers are likely to be become long-time advocates of brands 
um, advocates brands if they are more sustainable um, and make more ethical choice in the marketing process. So companies which uh, which respect environment do not uh, hurt animals and more uh, do not use chemicals that can hurt um, you know be be uh, take a longer time to degrade. Those are um, companies, especially in cosmetics, in medicines, in other in clothes, etc. Um, they they are they are favored by 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 the customers or the, the, the modern customers. And finally, I would say that this is again a more of an integrated marketing communication strategy. That's um, omni-channel communication strategy that is involving both traditional as well as digital interactions. It's a more holistic uh, kind of um, communication because customer engagement um, channels that they are more pro- effective in promoting customer engagement and, uh, and happiness. So companies that implemented the omni-channel strategy reported an NPS score, net promoter score of 8.5 compared to just 5.8 for companies that do not have such a strategy. I will conclude here. Um, I think um, this was a very brief uh, journey into the consumer pace. A lot can be said about it, but um, I thought that um, this was this was just a wrap up of the interaction. So I'll be, I'm, let, me, let me end here and I'm happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patnaik. And now I invite all the participants if you have any questions. In this so, Debayani, Paul Lami, you manage the questions yeah, yes, being asked yeah. by the participants. Yes. Yes. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, mm-hmm. The first one is from Vidisha. Uh, uh, are there any special management steps that are kept in mind to address the internal factors of consumers that is different personalities? Uh, could you please repeat it? I somehow it broke up the sound. Uh, yeah. Okay, could you please repeat yeah, the question? Read, uh, are there any me, special? Let me read the thing. I think you are experiencing network problem. So Vidisha wants to ask, sir, are there any special management steps that are kept in mind to address the internal factors of consumers, such as different personalities? Thank you. Yes. So yes. So if you if you go back to the. Um, the earlier brand, the consumer behavior model that I showed. So initially, the there are the psychological factors like where you are. Um, you know, the, the, so first of all, the marketing stimuli and the and the cultural factors and the product factors. Eventually, they impact on the individual. So we have to focus on the individuals' uh, factors of. Um, Perception, motivation, learning; those are the anchors which are which are really crucial in determining whether a a, a transaction takes place or not. Now, let me let me elaborate it a little bit. So, for example, if you have a, a motivation for um, for for to to go for sustainable. Um, I mean, you, your your value your your values are geared towards using sustainable product, right? So the company, when they, a brand which makes a pitch for that segment of customers, let's say, a, a, suppose they are appealing to a segment which is, which is, w- wants to be in a more sustainable place, then they, they, the entire, if you see the communication strategy or even in the everything they do in the value addition process, they will always focus on the sustainable. So the sustainability terms, which will be recurring, right? Um, same with um, almost anything. Um, like for instance, they they always want to have a, um, a a a positioning in the in the marketplace, which will be there in your top of the mind. So the positioning of the of any brands. Depends on the fact. I mean, in 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 to what psychological stimuli would you be would would a customer respond better? Um, let's, for example, uh, see some of the recent controversies. Right, um, you had companies which were really um, supporting in the in the advertisement world. They were supporting gender empowerment and women first, and so on. But also, and on other like Dove, the, there's a Procter and Gamble company, 
they were promoting the fairness that the light skin means a better you know you are more to be more attractive and this was this was a cognitive dissonance like on one hand you can't say everyone is valuable and on the other hand you kind of are promoting a kind of a racial stereotyping right so the company had a lot of pushback saying that this is what you are saying is not matched up with what how you are selling the product so resolving these uh, cognitive dissonances in the in the people's mind uh, in the consumer's mind and also being true to yourself being authentic to generate a sense of trust and to in, in you know inculcate that uh, that value that you that you that you, the value of the company aligns with the value of the individual that is very very important and that requires a lot of research and understanding of the of the target market now um i will not go into the stp um, design segmentation targeting positioning of the brand because that will take um, another few hours to explain but i will uh, suffice to say is that psychological variables are extremely important in fact the most important component in any marketing endeavor we cannot at the end of the day you are still persuading marketing is persuading you cannot force anyone to buy uh, or accept anything right so you have to make a persuasive scale a persuasive uh, strategy and so uh, how do you persuade the same um, same thing as you you use as psychologists use as you know uh, appealing the you know getting over the biases um, attitude change the leonian concept of unfreezing refreezing you know all all the change management stuff which is which you may have covered in your other disciplines works so um it's it is appealing to to the 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 psychological processes of individuals tapping into things that um that would they know that what would appeal and what would not and just as a as a as a, as, a, as a advertising uh person with advertising background i know that um i mean i can share with you that advertisers sometimes use some cues which are common to um humans all over the world so they always use sometimes use a, a baby's smile in the background that elicits the highest happiness in people right and so um also like they if they are showing a insurance um Uh, advertisement something they would prompt you to hey get a life insurance they will have some background stimuli to make you nervous or to make you worried so yes um the the psychological constructs and so there are there are there are specific techniques of uh, in different depending on which area of marketing one is in advertising or writing a you know, value creation individual factors are extremely important so thank you sir so uh, another participant mohit wants to ask how do you see marketing strategy or practice is different in developed economy as versus developing economy like india thank you well um i think they are in india uh, i mean every um, every culture has its own unique um, style of communication right so one of the thing that i noticed was let's say in advertising um in india many of the india and many many asian cultures where collectivism is is of uh, of more priority it appeals to the community it's more of a let's say let's say a hamara bajaj ad so whole lot of families in the single scooter or if you take a car advertisement you are inviting your relatives and your neighbors hey just hop in and we can go and for a long drive so the car drive is is for the whole family of whole joint family right everybody goes together in the movie everybody goes together whereas if you see the car advertisements in the west it's more of you know one or maybe a couple just driving into the sunset there are no relatives and neighbors in the in the, in the back seat so again these are cultural anchors that that influences and again in the in, in india for instance one of the most uh, successful advertisements in the past i think many of you may be too young to um, be around so it was like onida neighbors and we owners pride and um, that was that was a epoch making um advertise because advertisement the one of the rules is not to use negativity in the in, in ads that was to be the mantra but uh, you know owners envy um, 
yeah, neighbors and we owners pride. I'm sorry, neighbors and we owners pride. So you are actually using leveraged uh, envy in a neighbor, and basically in a in a collective society, we always look look after. We sometimes are more concerned about what will people think or say about the saving a face than in individual society when they don't care. I mean, it's it just it's me, and I don't care what others think about me. In a large, I'm mean, making generalizing um, in a way. So. Um, I wouldn't think say that um, the the they, they, there is really the Western or I mean it, advertisement or communication marketing has to be in tune with the target audience. And one of the companies that have really done it very well is Coca Cola. So Coca Cola, the jingles have very different. So the you know the must calendar, which was like the in the that jingle um, Coca Cola theme in the in the really successful in. In South in South Asia, um, and they have they have different varieties of that in different um, ways. Uh, McDonald's, for instance, again has different uh, versions of food depending on on the on the way they are. So again, they have uh, aloo tikki in uh, vegetarian dishes in the in India, and they have kosher food in uh, in the mid in the in the Middle East. Um, so so. Adapting to the local conditions is very important. So I don't think there is any gold standard um, that Indian um, advertise, Indian marketers have to uh, have to adopt. And in my my experience, when I was in the business development for telecom, so we instead of uh, like Diwali gifts, we as a government company, we did not have uh, enough funds to buy expensive gifts as corporates, right? The Western, like IBM comes and gives very expensive gifts. We didn't have, we had a very limited um, amount. So I said, okay, let's, let's tap on the, the, tap onto something which people will keep. Because if I give a, even a clock to its CEO, uh, they will probably pass it on to a, you know, one of the office staff. They will not keep it on the, on their on the table. So what we did was we had a small thali with Sindur and, you know, the puja stuff. And that was, even though it cost us less than, I think, 100 rupees, 120 rupees, it was actually regarded and said, well, nobody really throws out the puja stuff, you know, the worship. So they kept, they kept it in their private kitchen, you know, their, their, their small worship place with their head offices. And so, again, one has to be creative. More money does not automatically mean that you have more return on investment. You have to be creative. And Indian um, company marketing strategies have been actually very, very creative. I mean, I always um, look back on some of the strategies that they they they, they, they do it um, very successfully. However, at the same time, there is a tendency to copy and imitate uh, the West, and that that's not going to be a um, that's not that's not a sustainable strategy. You have to see who your target market is. You you can what works in Paris or in New York will not necessarily transfer itself. Um, to 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 conditions in India or anywhere else in the world, so you have to be. That's where the research part of it concerns, and that is um, a weakness in many of the marketing company, um, com- in, 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 in especially in companies in India where they not enough is spent on research um, in communication advertisements. I mean, if you go to um, pharmaceutical companies, in my experience, when you talk to in these pharma companies. Um, the whole, I mean, you meet more PhDs than you do in universities because they are engaged. They really do a lot of serious research work. So that's something that probably Indian marketing firms and companies um, can, can take a cue from. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, I have one question of my own. So uh, like I was wondering whether uh, keeping consumers happy or keeping them hooked to derive continuous flow of profits. I mean, what is the priority of, you know, most of the uh, the service providers or the product, you know, sellers? Because uh, even you pointed out that somewhere we are spoiled for choices and that somewhere, you know, leads to uh, more stress. And even in some of, you know, social media companies, you know, because they, even their service is a product kind and which is ultimately leading to long term, you know, stress, anxiety and negative thoughts among the consumers so like where we are heading in terms of these patterns thank you. yes so the traditionally um 
and this is again as as an individual i would say this is unfortunate um the the definition of business the 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 the, the purpose of business is business um was a kind of a cliche and so every time was there was there was a whole race of making more and more stuffing more and more stuff on the on the, the stores and offering huge sales 365 days in a year um and but that has now come that there is now a pushback but as you as you pointed out that there was there is it, it does exact a um psychological cost so you are always um feeling left out that you should not have the latest iphone or you do not have the latest um shoe sneakers then you are you are kind of not in it right um so the the, the pushback is in terms of um in, in people who said that okay this this is too much we we need to turn to ourselves does it we do i really need this extra 1000 features on television do i need to indulge um do i need to make this uh, go to the vacation or fancy place, you know um, places in order to enjoy myself so sometimes as um, i i always think that the real case said that the, the the best journeys are the voyages to insight in, to to inward meditation and um, reflecting so there is there is a there is a minimalist uh, as i mentioned there there is now a distinct uh movement especially among the younger generation and i see that in my undergraduate students of this um of, of this disdain they they don't like to wear brands anymore like nike or you know previously there was to have a people used to go around with their especially you know just you know as a push or something a lot of times and i see that in in my own family my, my children would take off the brands uh because they don't want to advertise um why, why should we be you know mobile and you know brand billboards for such products so there's a pushback and i think that's uh, it's slow um unfortunately and the business um obviously you know they they are under pressure to make uh, profits q1 q2 i mean you can teach as much ethics and good values to our students in the classroom but the minute they join a company they're expected to deliver profits right so um it it becomes um, difficult but however i think that some of the companies uh, many of the companies in fact are now have these back end uh, information so they they will have a code a qr code on the product and so if you um you know you go to the net and see how much of uh, in they, they have invested in sustainability um if you i bought a packet of fish the other day um, salmon and i was taken to some farm where they are kept in um you know how, how the fish are being treated with um, care and not overfishing and they are being replenished and so on so um consumption uh, obviously any kind of consumption is is um, in, involves certain amount of environmental degradation but getting this uh, minimizing our our product so there is there is a of course a, that's a very big area that you asked ankur and i'll be happy to discuss with you separately but there is a sustainability clock which says that there is a like how much uh we have uh, how much um, the earth can bear or tolerate it gives a kind of nuclear clock like the one minute of destruction so how much uh, the world can sustain can bear Uh, how much consumption we bear and it's uh, the clock it's the annual clock it stops at by at may or june and each year it is going close closer so by may it's by the, the fifth month the earth has produced enough that it can tolerate so everything that you are doing it for the rest of the six months is actually an overload it's a it's a so one has to question one's lifestyle and it it term starts with your values to what kind of values that you that you uh, socialize your, your children with and what kind of you know children especially are affected by the conduct of their parents and the family members right so i think before lecturing our students about the hard life that we had led and all the things that the great things we did as kid we have to be we have to walk the talk we ha- we, we if we set a standard then i think the uh, it will have a and a personal level then it has a cascading effect so um, to answer your question i hope 
the the the, the future would be much more um i mean consumption cannot be avoided in total but we have a more more pragmatic and more realistic and more sensitive to our environment uh, kind of consideration that should be in with us in future as consumers thank you thank you sir so we have uh, last two questions and then we can uh, wind up the question and answer session sure. so mm-hmm. gokul muthu ji wants to ask like uh, where do we draw the line between making the customer happy and putting undue pressure on the employees like in recent examples you know customers are uh, asked to provide feedback and anything less than 10 out of 10 you know is supposed to draw a lot of you know shaking up of the employees involved so like thank you and, yeah so uh, that's a great question and um, so as you know in marketing we talk about stakeholders so we, we the customers are external stakeholders right so the customers and the people who are who have invested in the company out to world so we have a resp- we we are obviously uh, accountable to them but we also should be mindful to our internal stakeholders so um building when we say building a trust um i do not really mean building a trust with outside agencies but also trust with our internal um employees uh with our internal stakeholders which are employees are a very big factor um this is a good organization uh also takes as much care if not more care in fact i've seen some arguments saying that uh some papers have stressed that companies should take better care of the employees than uh, even in more than the customers like, like charity begins at home but i think it it is it it is they true are not a uh, separate so the concept of emotional contagion which is a very powerful concept in management as many of you may be aware is like if we make the uh, if, if company if the employees are genuinely happy then it will reflect on their interaction that their happiness will be contagious as they interact with customers right so you cannot just have a script to the customers and say um, i mean if if you say that oh you was always to be in, say sorry or thank you um just reading out a script if they do not really mean it and the customers will immediately sense it that this person is not really meaning it right so building a um a a a a um healthy workplace and employee situation is a paramount importance and all great companies do that uh so companies um now it's no longer a choice actually the post pandemic era especially you may have heard about the great resignation all over the all over the world actually not just in the us the people as the companies are uh, the employees are quitting he said enough i don't um, you know even, even though i get less money from this organization if i'm not happy i'm not going to work for you so companies are forced to devise their um the user strategy of just throwing more money but really um you know i would say exploiting the workers so they have to build up a more congenial atmosphere so they have to have uh, many of the companies are have now child care offering child care as a matter of course is not an exception anymore providing more transparency that what's 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 the decision that is taken at the you know c suits or the executive level also are, are transmitted down the 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 chain um having a more more collegial more um the team spirit is is of of vital importance for companies these days so to answer um, the question is that you cannot have consumer delight unless you delight your unless you are your employees are happy and that's that's that involves uh, a systematic change in the organizational values and organizational environment and culture so it's it's not as easy as um, you know saying that hey tomorrow you just go and say offer these incentives that to be you know um, to, to to do this say this nice stuff unless you you are at every level every employee by the way is a brand ambassador of the, of the company so even in the office when you go to a office the first in an indian office for instance when you are familiar with like the first person you talk to maybe maybe a the guard or the other peon or somewhere so he or she may be the in maybe may, may may rank the lowest in the organizational totem but the your interaction with the clerk or with the peon or whoever 
is a representative. I mean, you come back talking to that person and say, hey, the customs department is bad or the sales tax is corrupt or whatever. So unless the culture change is permeated and transmitted to each and every aspect of the organization, it's any initiative to make ensure a better experience for consumers or for your customers is not going to work. So they, 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 they go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So Paulumi has one question. Paulumi, can you like us in person? Please go ahead. Uh, good. I couldn't hear you though. Uh, Paulumi, uh, am I am I audible yes. now? Yes, yes, yes. No. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for the very enriching session. I just have a small question. Um, I think in one of the uh, theories that you were mentioning, you did mention that consumers are inherently uh, risk averse in nature. So we go for uh, where there is some kind of certainty of winning rather than going for a big chance where you lose win, but you uh, you lose big or but you win big as well. So in this post pandemic period, sir, a lot of changes have to taken place, like a lot of traditional setups have broken down. So I'm just wondering that has there been a transformation in this uh, particular risk averse aspect as well? Because are we now a little more open to uh, taking chances, uh, say startups or relying more on the virtual uh, networks? That's my question, sir. That's a great question. And I don't think I have seen any uh, scientific study to the um, study to that effect that whether people have become more risk averse in terms of their um, tangible uh, benefits. But just from anecdotal evidence or experience, I would think that people, the value system of what we want has changed. So, for instance, um, there is more risk taking in terms of your choice of career, for instance, like the work life balance, which we used to, we are always aware of it, but kind of swept on the carpet, uh, thinking that if we earn more money, then it will, you know, we will be overall better. And then it, it doesn't matter if I'm putting in extra hours and at this, you know, I, I'm not, I'm missing out some family events or not talking to this, uh, my relatives or friends. Um, over a period of time, the sudden departures of so many people suddenly at the prime of the careers in COVID or other related um, you know, ailments has certainly realized, made us realize that, you know, um, life has other, you know, the life is worth living. It's not just getting, um, you know, these material um, possessions really eventually mean nothing. I mean, that's what our um, the philosophers, the monks have been telling us over a period along for, for centuries, but we didn't really listen. I said, yeah, sure, but you know, if, if I have this extra um, the promotions and so on, it's, it's good. I mean, what can we do? Especially when you're young, uh, you don't think about death, right? So death is only for really old people, but not for us. And then you realize, hey, this person was just in his, um, you know, prime of his youth. Uh, she was so, she had everything going and she committed. You find um, stories of people being depressed and ending their lives and or dying of uh, suddenly dying of ailments, COVID, and so on. So it, it definitely has impacted um, the perspective um, and made you more thoughtful, right? So what you thought was risk suddenly becomes very practical observation. No, I need to be with um, with myself. I need to take care of my health. I need to go out for the morning walk. I don't have to be hooked up my laptop or computers 24 by 7, right? So to that extent, yes, I, I think it's, there's a more shift in, in, in the value system and you become more inward looking, more reflective. So yes, in, in terms of that, you have become more, more risk taker. Uh, in terms of uh, investment, um, I'm not sure if that has been, in fact, if all uh, some people are a little more conservative, have become more conservative with their with their resource allocation. So far as budget are concerned, they would no longer have, um, you know, they no longer would like to burn themselves out by um, by by taking risky ventures. So they are saying, okay, 
that we will be satisfied with with bonds and more 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 secure instruments uh, at least that's what uh, the financial data has told us so far so yes the answer to that in terms of material uh, concept the prospect theory which we are referring to is a little unclear i probably haven't done enough research myself but i would say in person at personal level at psychological level we have become more innovative more entrepreneurial uh, in terms of uh, taking care of ourselves and when i say just not ourselves but our immediate family the and our psychological well-being has definitely um been given of more importance than before thank you very oh, much thank sir. you so much sir so now um, over to atashi ma'am like yeah ankur so thank you very much professor patnaik and our students also have well participated in this conversation so uh professor patnaik uh, uh, anything else to do or uh, we should wind up the session so then i can request professor goha does look he goha to give a vote of thanks i think i i think i spoken too much <laughs> so <laughs> i'll i'll just uh, you know as i told you yesterday i am a uh, i i joke that i am a recovering bureaucrat and a academic so two kinds of people who love a captive audience so um i probably um please excuse me if i have spoken too long but this is something this is an opportunity to talk please to you please 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 to so, interact with you i have nothing more to say <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. professor patnai would you like to say something or uh professor goha i will just do my case waiting that's okay uh, i mean if professor uh, uh, this uh, is not we have Has something to to add? I think some some do sir. You should say something about uh, you know this gross national happiness and consumer happiness. How these two things can go together? So our students will be very much. I don't think I would like to burden students. They have been sitting here. No, it's not a burden. It's a powers. <laughs> no, it's, it's just a conversation. Talk. so they are all our students and we are here right here but gross national happiness you will be surprised in bhutan we don't have billboards there's no advertisement done in bhutan you as a customer decide on your own i can give you so many very interesting examples in bhutan uh, you know there old bakery that's of course no more there people i mean they were so loyal to this bakery that when even the quality of the bring bakery products went down they continued going there and at a at it, it, a point came where they said all the customers they got together to say let's do something to so that we can enhance this you know bakery to give us better products you see customers when you maintain when you when you when they are really um connected and they become loyal to a certain not really brand even face you know the owner himself the place itself many conditions are around and uh, they want to be there all the time because they take it as a part of themselves you know and then of course you have customers uh, all along to uh, but then of course depends also when the ownership changes how people react they come like youngsters they become more modern to do something else and they broke down this bakery still today people cry for this bakery but it's no more there existing there's a huge bill everybody remembers so yeah bhutan we do a lot of uh, work on uh, two things are very paramountly important for gnh one is the environment which uh, professor patnaik was speaking about and the other is the society so we don't want to tax society with so much of advertisement and board them to you know take through the advertisement sensitize them to take a product we rather believe in you decide what product you want of course there is also the concept of consumerism there there's a lot lot of tussles between the rights of consumers and what we should really do or not do there's a lot of conflicts there but all said and done two things are very very important gnh one is definitely 
that any product that comes into the market or that we have should not harm environment. For example, Bhutan had a policy and built into a rule. In fact, it was passed by the parliament in 2004. No plastic in Bhutan. But how can you do it? Because all material things come packed in plastic. And people, they are encouraged to carry their own bag to the shopping uh, spaces. But somehow, you know, uh, you necessarily don't go to a market to buy something. Go for a stroll and you find something interesting. You don't have a bag. You buy in the plastic and, you know, things there. Things like that are very, very difficult to control. They called it a draconian law. Smoking, for example, no cigarettes or any tobacco can be sold in Bhutan. Because mm -hmm. that rule is changing after many years. Because, you know, punishment was so harsh that even if you are found like it's, uh, you are in drugs and you carry, let's say, 250 grams, more, more than 250 grams in a pocket in Singapore, you will be shot to death. There's no rule or law that can protect you. you know, like that, we also had such a harsh law that if you are found with 250 grams of tobacco, chewing tobacco, you would have to go to jail for 10 years or something like that. So now people started to resist. Now there's where the customer rights come in. So started to fight back and now they are revisiting the whole law. So there's a lot of, I mean, things to think about. <laughs> Anyways, yes. I will not bore the students. It's been a long, long time now. A long session. In fact, very interesting and really grateful to Professor Patnaik. As a commerce student, which I thought I would let it go, many things comes back to me. Not everything, but I really enjoyed and refreshed a lot of my own things of the past. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. That is fascinating. I mean, really, really insightful. See, yeah, Professor Patnak, I have just one, uh, not exactly question, a query, like that during this pandemic, uh, social change, major social change has taken place, taken place all across the globe, all in every country, even across the culture also. So how, how it has influenced uh, the customer needs or they're looking at their future needs or the, you can say the customer preferences or the consumer preferences. Because this pandemic has brought a large, uh, you know, major change, shift in the, uh, not only the conditions, the living style, everything. So drastic change in the lifestyle of the uh, citizens. So how has this influenced the customer's preferences or needs, choices and they're thinking about the future consumptions also. This is the holistic the question, sir. Well, I think uh, the major change has, um, to not to belabor the point, that a lot of things have gone online. So the digital platforms have really uh, been strengthened. Even companies that did not have a digital presence, uh, social media presence, they have really amped it up. They have really beefed it up. Um, so there are a lot of uh, things that then that are not going to go away even after the pandemic is over. So, for instance, the curbside pickup that instead of, um, you know, people don't have to go to the stores or um, anymore. In fact, the stores is coming to you, right? Delivery services have been strengthened in a very big way. Um, eating out, which was the major um item in the, in the how people is to spend uh, in going out and eating in restaurants and even though and in, for instance here in the US um, the restrictions have been lifted but I still see the, the restaurants not really as packed as they were before because people people are still wary so um, the takeout food the eating at home uh, eating ordering online uh, choosing areas of, um, you know, the, the products which are geared towards uh, health and well-being, um, that that has, um, like, assumed um, more, imp more importance. So, uh, I don't know whether all these changes were going to be permanent, but it does seem that there was a change in focus on 
um, in after especially after pandemic to people were more more attentive to their personal well-being both mental and physical and so the expenditures on those have have gone up especially um, exercise equipments have seen a, a marked rise uh, in in their in profitability companies like the peloton the, the company the exercise company is one of the top now most profitable ones so i think that consumers have um, now going in more for more utilitarian goods than the hedonistic goods um, and more accessible uh, which which they can have it delivered at home rather than go to the stores which has had this other effect of many malls closing down of course this trend was there before even before the pandemic but it has got accelerated because of the pandemic so um so there is it is too early to say whether um this is actually becoming this will be a permanent feature or not <clears throat> but uh, just from uh, the perspective of um, from what we see around and what we read in the papers and in, in the published um, in the journals it does seem that the consumer focus has become <clears throat> more uh, geared towards um to towards health and well-being and emphasis on um, you know the, the also the, the 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 role of communities have also gone up significantly now even if and I, i'm talking about virtual communities so a, a website called next door next door neighbor next door and they have it started off in the you know, in california now it has become one of the top sites for neighbors to 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 talk to themselves and exchange views about what they are doing how they can help each other um recently in our locality there was a um there was offer we in fact we participated in on it on shoveling snow from our neighbors elderly neighbors um because in 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 the west it's difficult to know if and when your neighbors are because people are you know they they either go to work or they spend their life themselves but now there's much more of commonality so i think that the all these these, these are enabled by these digital networks and i think that human interaction is again uh, being placed a more is, is as a premium when people like to spend more time interacting at a social and psychological level rather than and just on going to the mall and uh, spending their life in a more in 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 and and, and, and and eating out and so on so uh, we'll see how, how that pans out but right now i think that um, definitely there is a more the trend towards taking care of oneself and also connecting with each other at a more human level and uh, i think the after the pandemic one has realized how much one missed work not not the work it's a workplace because we all were dying to go back to office and not just for the same work one can do at home but back you know to see to interact to to meet people at the cafeteria and so on so a lot of it is not going to be as it was before but certainly it has it has um you know brought back the importance of human interaction and that i think is is a good thing so we'll see um how it pans out in future thank you very much uh, now professor guwar as lucky guwar you please kindly give a vote of thanks to our uh, yes. esteemed speaker and others yeah uh thank you but uh, before i start with the vote of thanks i would like to add to what professor patnaik was saying uh one of them being that uh, you know uh, he spoke about hedonistic uh, uh you know buying so that has reduced and uh, there was a wonderful study about a, a huge number of people in tokyo moving from the city back to the villages so probably the pandemic uh uh you know it's important to uh, survive uh, from our basic uh, needs identify our uh, smallest pleasures than moving on to or looking for demands materialistic demands so um, thank you professor patnaik uh, i i am truly grateful to you for uh, giving us this enriching talk today on a chilly morning and that also with your ill health 
um thank you for illuminating us and enriching us uh, with uh, personal anecdotes and discussing consumer happiness in a completely different perspective so we really uh, appreciate your being with us here on a weekend and i'd like to thank all the participants for joining in and pitching in with their questions and thank you professor uh, chetri for uh, giving us that uh, beautiful perspective from bhutan and um, i i thank you again professor priyadashi patnayak the head of the center i i truly miss uh, professor mandal and uh, dr reki today because i'm sure uh, we would have some more enriching questions uh, from them and as i understand our participants here are uh, still have questions but it's already 806 so uh, isd so i will not uh, keep you any longer so um, a very good morning to 